Section 10 of Bismarck by Georges Lacour Gaillet. Translated by M. Harriet M. Capes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 5 The German Empire, Part 2. In that same year, 1874, Bismarck had set up in Alsace Lorraine an administration which appeared to offer the annexed people some guarantees. Thirty delegates, elected by the general councils of Strasbourg, Colmar, and Metz, made up the district commission, Landesausschuss, which was to manage the affairs of the country. But it was nothing but a consultative or registering chamber. All power was in the hands of a governor, the emperor's lieutenant, Stadthalter, who was assisted by a secretary of state and four ministers. This regime became definitive by the law of the 4th of July, 1879, which fixed the administrative status of the Reichsland. The suppression of the dictatorship and the establishment of a regular regime produced no better result than that of force either in the country of Auberle or in that of Colette Vaudoche. Alsace-Lorraine, unconquerable, remained faithful to its memories and its hopes. In 1875, Bismarck nearly made France pay for the ill-humor which his want of success in the Empire land caused him. At the time of the Commune, the Chancellor had accepted the overtures made him on behalf of the Federals by Clouseret, and had shown less eagerness in listening to Versailles than to Paris. It was a kind of blackmail which he was trying to levy on the plenipotentiaries of the French government. In 1875, France had completely freed herself from her financial obligations to Germany. The convention of the 15th of March, 1875, negotiated by Thiers, had settled the payment of the last hundred millions and the evacuation of territory, which was an accomplished fact in the month of September. Verdun, the heroic city, which has now for three years withstood the assaults of Germany, had been the last to be evacuated, and at last France was free. In her side she bore a bleeding wound, but at least she belonged to herself. The Iron Chancellor followed with uneasiness the military and economic revival of France, which had begun under the presidency of Thiers and continued under that of Mac Mahon. France is recovering too fast, he had said as early as 1872, the year in which Thiers had brought in the military law which gave our country a fresh army. Suddenly, in the spring of 1875, pessimistic rumors began to circulate. France was about to be attacked by Germany, it was said. A paper inspired by the Wilhelmstrasse, the Post, on the 8th of April, published an article under the heading, Is War in Sight? Ending with, Yes, certainly, war is in sight, although, of course, the cloud may disperse. No one doubted that Bismarck had inspired this article. The cause or the pretext for this bellicose agitation was the discussion in the National Assembly of Versailles of a law as to the cadres which increased the number of battalions in a regiment. Germany was no longer represented at Paris by the famous Count Harry von Arnhem, unscrupulously ambitious, as Bismarck called him, not finding him supple enough. My ambassadors, the Chancellor had said to Count von Arnim himself, are wheels, which ought to turn at a sign from me, as a simple sergeant performs a movement at the order given by the commander-in-chief, without knowing why. As the Paris wheel turned badly, Bismarck had removed von Arnim, and then had had him tried for abstracting official documents, and the former ambassador had been sentenced to nine months' imprisonment in 1874. His successor in the Rue de Lille was Prince Clovis von Hohenlohe Schillingsfürst, formerly Prime Minister of Bavaria. 
On the 5th of May, 1875, Hohenlohe had gone to the Quai d'Orsay to lay the grievances of his government before the Duc de Caz, Minister for Foreign Affairs in the Buffet Ministry. Our general staff, he said, always looks upon the final aim of your military organization as war against Germany. Happily for her, the France of 1875 possessed the sympathy in Europe which had failed the France of 1870. The French ambassador at Petersburg, General Le Flo, had personally confided to Alexander II his patriotic uneasiness, and the Tsar had not confined himself to reassurances, but had acted in person for the maintenance of the peace. Coming to Berlin, with Chancellor Gorchakov on the 10th of May, he had found his old uncle, the Emperor William, sincerely pacific in disposition. At the same time, Bismarck received a pressing request from Disraeli to maintain peace in Europe. He then laid the blame for all this warlike agitation on the old Marshal von Moltke, but he discovered to whom he must speak. Gorchakov had an interview with him at Berlin, at which the English ambassador, Odo Russell, made a third. Bismarck complained that there should be any doubt of his desire to maintain peace. He spent sleepless nights in attempting to find means to assure it. It is just those sleepless nights, answered Gorchakov, that make us uneasy. Remember that you bear the burden of your glory. When you suffer from insomnia, Europe is feverish. Bismarck's vexation was extreme. He blamed everybody. The French ambassador at Berlin, the Vicomte de Gontaut-Biron, who, according to him, had set it all going, and the Russian Chancellor. He advised Gorchakov to have coins struck with the words, Gorchakov protects France, on the reverse. He advised him also to appear on the stage, disguised as a guardian angel in a white robe and wings in the midst of Bengal lights. At one moment he gave in his resignation, which was not accepted. All he could do was to go and get over his anger on his Vartsen estate. Only four years after the Treaty of Frankfurt, he had come up against the polite but firm intervention of Russia and England, who had prevented a fresh war on France. On leaving Berlin, Alexander had sent his sister, the Queen of Württemberg, a reassuring telegram. I am taking with me from Berlin a formal assurance of peace. This telegram was reproduced in the papers with this witticism, which greatly increased Bismarck's fury. L'emporté of Berlin gives formal assurances of peace. L'emporté de Berlin may recall the Tolle Juncker of the Chancellor's youth. From this war alarm of 1875, two conclusions may be deduced. One, that Bismarck and the military party were constant in their idea that France must be crushed at whatever cost. The other, that the relations between Russia and Germany had no longer the cordial character which in 1872 had marked the interview of the three emperors. The Congress of Berlin was soon to bring forth a fresh and deep cause for dissent between Berlin and Petersburg. During the summer of 1875, an insurrection had broken out in the Turkish province of Herzegovina. Once again, a conflagration was rekindling in the Balkans, and all the problems of the Protean Eastern question were about to be set up afresh. Twenty years earlier, at the time of the Crimean War, Prussia had been completely indifferent to the Eastern question. But since then, how many changes had come about in the general situation? Prussia was no longer merely a German power. She had risen to the first rank of great European powers. Her commerce was beginning to represent great interests in the provinces of the Turkish Empire. Lastly, she was allied to two great states which were directly concerned in the Eastern question. 
the Russia of Alexander II, faithful to its historic traditions, never lost its interest in Constantinople and its brothers of the Orthodox faith. Austria, forbidden by Sadova to mix in German affairs, had a natural inclination to look for some compensation in those of the Balkans. But its policy could not act in the lower Danube country without coming against the policy of Russia. What would be the attitude of Germany, caught between the contradictory ambitions of its two allies? Bismarck's sympathy was certainly with Austria-Hungary. The Chancellor, Andrassy, was the man for his policy, inclined as he was to look toward the east. Gorchakov, on the contrary, reminded him of the unpleasant intervention of May 1875 when Russia had shown friendliness to France. Still, the German Chancellor thought it wise to maintain neutrality toward both his neighbors, anyhow, until events allowed him to take a decided side. Two years were passed in discussions and diplomatic conferences until the massacre of Christians redoubled in the Turkish provinces and Gladstone aroused the indignation of Europe by denouncing the Bulgarian atrocities. There were those in Germany who were astonished at the abstention of the government and seemed to regret it. Bismarck, from the Tribune of the Reichstag, on the 7th of December, 1876, stated his interpretation of Eastern affairs. We are reproached, he said, with being too much inclined to peace and of not making use, as we ought, of the power in our hands. In the meantime, the hour for making use of this power is not come, and, please God, will not come for us. Our policy must be used in consulting our own interest, and we shall not be led by any offer to any other policy than that. Therefore, I do not advise any active participation by Germany in these matters, for in them is no advantage for Germany that is worth, excuse the roughness of the expression, the bones of one Pomeranian fusilier and today what must be the thoughts of the souls of thousands of pomeranian fusiliers who since nineteen fourteen have let their bones be broken for ferdinand the felon and for mohammed v whose senile imbecility amuses itself by having greeks and armenians massacred for bismarck bulgarians rumanians and serbians all the balkans were one and the same breed. All sheep-stealers, he said. Thank God it is not necessary to be a great student of the Eastern question, not to confuse the executioners with the victims. Stealers, yes, the Bulgarians, who joined brigandage with cynicism and flount, but not for long, the proceeds of their thefts. But the heroic Serbs, who have suffered and still suffer so cruelly, and the Rumanians, who joined us so nobly and were twice betrayed, betrayed by Tsarist Russia, betrayed by Maximalist Russia, how, I say, will not only the Entente, but the impartial historian find words to tell Belgrade and Bucharest of its admiration and gratitude. But Russia, weary of waiting for a collective intervention of the great powers, determined in April 1877 to make a direct attack on Turkey, Romania alone ever valiant, ever eager to fulfill its historical destiny, joined its armies with those of Russia. After the taking of Plevna, in which the Romanians played so great a part, the Russians crossed the Balkans, passed victoriously through the whole of Bulgaria, and paused only at the very gates of Constantinople. On the 3rd of March, 1878, at San Stefano, they dictated the conditions of peace to the Turks. One of the most important was the creation of a principality of greater Bulgaria, reaching from the Danube to the Aegean Sea. The statue 
of Alexander II, the liberator of the Bulgarians, stands in the principal promenade of Sophia in memory of this great event. What must Ferdinand and his ministers, now the best friends with the Turks, think when they pass this monument? Nothing at all, no doubt, for at Sophia, as at Berlin, the protests of conscience caused no disquiet to statesmen. Bismarck had kept silence during the whole of the Russo-Turkish War. After the Treaty of San Stefano, he made a fresh statement in the Reichstag. This was taken up with full approval, the idea just brought forward by his friend Andrassi of holding an international conference for the making of modifications in the Treaty of the 3rd of March. He thus defined the part Germany was disposed to play in these European discussions. I am not of opinion that we should follow the Napoleonic road, or that we should wish to be, I do not say, even the arbiter, but even the schoolmaster of Europe. Ours is a more modest role. I picture it to myself as that of an honest broker who really wants to bring the matter to a good end. Gorchakov was aware of the trap into which his rival was luring him, but to refuse the conference meant a fresh war in the near future, and after the lengthy effort Russia had just made, she had great need of recovery. The German government let it be known that the conference would open at Berlin, the choice of the capital of the Kingdom of Prussia and of the German Empire was truly the material consecration of the ascendancy which Bismarck and his policy held in Europe. The Congress sat for a month, from the 13th of June to the 13th of July, and the final treaty was a complete alteration of the Treaty of San Stefano. Two very important questions, in which the honest broker carried the day, were settled in a fashion very disagreeable to Russia. Greater Bulgaria was to be cut up into three portions, of which one only kept a relative independence. The Turkish provinces of Bosnia and Herzegovina, Serbian in race, were to be occupied and administered by Austria-Hungary. In the first matter, Bismarck had joined hands with Lord Beaconsfield, in the second with Count Andrassi. In both cases, Russia had been tricked. Bismarck had had Turkey given two-thirds of the Bulgaria of San Stefano, thus securing for the future Germany's political and economic interests on the shores of the Bosphorus. On the other hand, only twelve years after Sedova, he enabled his Austrian friends to obtain a fine territorial compensation. He turned aside the Habsburg monarchy still further from Germany, and he made it into a Balkan power, which was another means of using it in the future in opposition to Russian ambitions. So the honest broker deemed his work had been well done. Without taking any tip for himself, he had remade the map of the Balkans in his own way, and his twofold program had not cost him the bones of a single Pomeranian fusilier. At the Congress, Bismarck had shown great attention to the French delegation, the head of which was Waddington, foreign minister in the Dufour cabinet. He willingly took a part in the discussions concerning the eventual occupation of Tunis, which Waddington was then having with Lord Salisbury. It was not displeasing to him that France should turn her eyes away from the Rhine frontier. Besides, the question of Tunis might some day embroil Italy and France, and that promised a future Italo-Prussian alliance, which was not to be despised. The results of the Congress of Berlin had caused lively dissatisfaction at the Russian court and in Russian public opinion. Bismarck took no heed of it. He was too much engaged in cultivating his good relations with Vienna. In October 1879, these resulted in a treaty of alliance between Germany and Austria, the first link in the future 
triple alliance. The old emperor alone remained disposed for the former alliance with Russia. In his eyes it represented family relations as much as those of policy. In September, at Alexandrovo, he had had a personal interview with his nephew, Alexander II, but that had changed nothing in the general situation. He went to Alexandrovo, said Bismarck, in spite of all I could do to prevent him. The Russians turned his head by telling him sentimental stories about Queen Louise, and William had been obliged, almost against his will, to sign the Alliance for Peace and Reciprocal Defense, which had been negotiated between Bismarck and Andrassy. To conclude the alliance with Austria-Hungary, Bismarck traveled in person to Vienna. The journey had the character of a triumph for him. In train, in carriage, everywhere he was cheered and applauded. Verily, the German-Austrian knew as little of dignity as of rancor. As for the Iron Chancellor, he was in raptures. Coalitions are your nightmare, Count Shivalov, second Russian plenipotentiary at the Berlin Congress, had said to him. Necessarily, he had replied, but here was the nightmare vanishing away. The alliance between Germany and Austria-Hungary in 1879 was an event of capital importance in European politics. On the one hand, it was the starting point of the intimacy between Berlin and Vienna, whose consequences we see today. The Emperor King of Vienna Budapest was about to be a brilliant second and would finally become simply a vassal or a prisoner. On the other hand, the Treaty of 1879 made it necessary for Russia to seek an alliance as a counterpoise to the Austro-German grouping, and she therefore began to look towards France. The Franco-Russian alliance was one day to be the result of the cavalier fashion in which Bismarck had treated Russia at the Congress of Berlin. Soon the Chancellor found fresh support for his policy on the other side of the Alps. The French expedition to Tunis and the Treaty of Bardo in 1881 had been a cause of acute displeasure in Italy. King Humbert had a lively admiration for the greatness of Germany. His government was more than willing to hold out a hand to Berlin. Bismarck very willingly accepted these overtures, if he did not instigate them, and as his foreign policy was already founded on the Austrian alliance, he induced Italy to enter into the same combination, which, with the questions of Trent and Trieste and Italian irredentism, was, in short, to marry the Republic of Venice to the Grand Turk. Thus, in 1882, was formed the Compact of the Triple Alliance, which was to be renewed several times. When Crispi was president of the Council in Italy, the Triple Alliance took up a decidedly hostile attitude toward France. Notably, on the occasion of his two visits to his friend Bismarck, who received him in 1887 and 1888 at his Friedrichsruhe estate, and again when Humbert I came to Berlin in 1889 to return the visit William had paid the Quirinal at his accession. Since the present war, the Triple Alliance has ceased to be. Italy has found herself back again, where her traditions, her sympathies, her interest showed her her true place, besides France, against Austria. In 1882, Bismarck could look with satisfaction at the map of Europe. On the west, France was isolated. In the center, Berlin, Vienna, and Rome formed a closely united group. On the east, the Russia of Alexander II was turning its attention toward the difficulties of its internal policy. The author of the Triple Alliance believed himself strong enough to renew the alliance of the three emperors. 
In 1884, a convention was signed afresh by William I, Francis Joseph, and Alexander III, who, moreover, had a personal interview at Skirnevis in Russian Poland. Bismarck plumed himself on this reassurance treaty, which made him more than ever the master of European politics. But the force of events was soon to prove stronger than these artificial combinations. Russia and France would not long delay their rapprochement. In 1891, at the time of the occurrences at Kronstadt, Bismarck was no longer in power, but in the bitterness of his retirement he was able to declare that in the diplomatic edifice he had laboriously reared henceforth a great fissure would be perceived. The first governor of Alsace-Lorraine, after that country had been made a regular regime, had been General Manteuffel, a gentleman of the old school with scarcely anything of Germanic stiffness, the choice which was due to William himself might be looked upon as a happy one. To keep an eye upon him, the Chancellor had given him his own son, Count William von Bismarck, as private secretary. Manteuffel came with a program of conciliation. He had said at Colmar, I respect the attachment the Alsatians feel for the great country to which they have been united for two hundred years. So long a period can never be blotted out. In the same way, at Metz he had said, I feel with you how painful it must be to be separated from France, so distinguished by her genius and her previous life. I wish to pay my court to the Alsatians, because I understand their feelings. And again at Strasbourg, as of old, the doges of Venice used to wed the sea. I should like to do the same with Alsace-Lorraine. The Germans twitted Manteuffel with his weakness, but the Alsace-Lorrainers were not won over, though the administrative measures had no longer so brutal a character. The elections of 1881 again sent 15 protesting deputies to the Reichstag. Manteuffel reverted partially to the more vigorous measures. He suppressed newspapers and prohibited French clubs. But the Chancellor found this insufficient. Germanization made no progress. Manteuffel died in 1885, in the sixth year of his governorship, and Bismarck appointed Prince von Hohenlohe as his successor. The former ambassador to Paris carried out the instructions from Berlin in a much more docile manner. Measures became more harsh than ever. A deputy from Metz, Monsieur Antoine, was expelled as guilty of intercourse with the hereditary enemy. Alsace-Lorrainers, who had adhered to the League of Patriots, were sentenced by the courts of Leipzig two years of imprisonment in fortresses. A passport, visé, at the German embassy in Paris was required from every Frenchman coming to the Reichsland. Even the stay of foreigners in Alsace-Lorraine was subjected to numberless formalities. These vexatious measures brought about a state of great tension in the relations between France and Germany. When, in 1879, the government had asked for a seven years' renewal of the military credits, the deputies had complained of the increase of the financial burden that weighed on Germany, and Moltke had answered, Do you wish to return Alsace-Lorraine to France? That would alter the matter. If you do not wish it, you can only accept the proposal. In 1886, the Reichstag was again asked for a considerable addition for the same purpose, and again for another period of seven years. In order to obtain it, Bismarck, from the tribune of the Reichstag, spoke of the dangers which Germany might incur from France. Between us and France, he said, the work of peace is difficult, because for very long there has existed an historical lawsuit which divides the two countries. It is the determining of the frontier which has become doubtful and litigious 
since the time when France acquired complete unity and royal power. This lawsuit is not ended, and we must expect to see it continue on the side of the French. We are in actual possession of the object of litigation, if I may so describe Alsace. We have therefore no motive for fighting for it, but that France still dreams of reconquering it all must admit, at least all who pay any attention to the French press. I have confidence in the pacific disposition of the French government and of the majority of the French people, but I cannot lull myself into sufficient security to enable me to say that we need no longer fear a French war. It is my conviction that it is through an attack from France that we must fear it. Whether it be in ten days or ten years is a question I cannot answer. After all, the Reichstag turned a deaf ear to his arguments, consenting to vote the credits asked for only for three years. They were dissolved. A very fiery electoral campaign ensued. The official newspapers set up General Boulanger, then French war minister, as a bugbear, and the new Reichstag voted the increase in the credits for the seven years asked for. And then over Alsace, that unhappy land, reigned what M. Price called the graveyard peace. Soon afterwards, there happened an incident on the frontier which had all the appearance of a provocation from Germany. M. Schnabelet, special commissioner of pagny sur moselle had received an invitation from his German colleagues at Ars-sur-Moselle to go to the frontier to settle some matter. Schnabelet went to the meeting place on the 27th of April, 1887. He had passed the frontier post when two police agents set upon him and seized him. He succeeded in freeing himself and regaining French soil, but he was followed by the German agents, arrested by them, and carried off. This waylaying was doubly serious, since it was a violation of French territory. The French foreign minister, Flourens, sent a very strong note to the ambassador Herbet. For some days Bismarck lay low. He charged his eldest son, Count Herbert, with the following up of the matter. France insisted. Her rights were explicit. The emperor, who felt his end approaching, did not want a fresh war. At the end of a week, the French commissioner was set at liberty. If Bismarck had contemplated an evil blow at the hereditary enemy, the thing had missed fire. The same year the first period of the Triple Alliance was coming to an end. Bismarck renewed his alliance with Vienna and Rome for another five years till 1892. This did not prevent him from increasing the armaments. In 1888 there was a fresh demand for credits to increase the German army by 700,000 men, and once more France was the theme of the Chancellor's bellicose harangues. The prospect on the French side, he said, at the Reichstag on the 8th of February, 1888, looks more pacific, much less explosive than it did a year ago, but war is not always made for hate's sake, for if this were so, France ought to be incessantly at war, not only with us, but also with England and Italy. She hates all her neighbors. We might easily be taken in by friendship and benevolence too easily, perhaps, playing the saint. But by threats, certainly not. We Germans fear God, but nothing else in all the world. If the Chancellor had not been seized with furor Teutonicus, he might have been asked, Whence came these threats? Was not he himself their best and only contriver? If France felt hatred, it was against neither England nor Italy, with whose powers she could have but rivalries or misunderstandings which would vanish at the first explanation. 
the hatred she kept in her heart was for germany who had stolen her goods and for germany alone the treaty of frankfurt had incorporated in germany two french provinces in spite of the formal protests of their inhabitants let us never weary of repeating it ever since then an ulcer lloyd george has used the word quite recently has infected european peace all the rhodomontades of a bismarck cannot alter the truth the peace of the world will never be restored until the day when the great injustice done to france is repaired until the day when it shall have been made impossible for bismarck's country to do any further wrong to the rights and liberty of others End of section ten Section 11 of Bismarck by Georges Lacour Gaillet. Translated by M. Harriet M. Capes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 6 Last Fights, Part 1. The Constitution given to the German Empire by Bismarck in 1871 had nothing parliamentary about it. The Chancellor was responsible solely to the Emperor, who was responsible to no one, since his hereditary power depended purely and simply on his quality as head of the Hohenzollern House. The Reichstag, elected by universal suffrage, had only a negative power. It might thwart the Chancellor's acts by refusing to vote for the legal proposals presented to it, but such refusal was tantamount to its committing suicide, for in such a case it was dissolved to give place to a fresh and more docile assembly. Still, negative as was the power of the Reichstag, it was frequently a source of embarrassment to Bismarck. In fact, it was almost impossible for him to count on a compact and faithful majority. This is explained by the particularist spirit which had long reigned in Germany and which the abrupt unification of 1866 to 1871 had not modified. Putting aside the less important divisions of the Reichstag, at least in the years that followed 1871, five principal parties might be counted. The Conservative Party Deutsch Conservatif, was made up of large landed proprietors, the agrarians, and was recruited almost entirely from the agricultural districts of East Prussia. It practically represented the Prussian and not the German spirit. If the liberals inclined to absorb Prussia in Germany, these had exactly the opposite inclination, that of absorbing germany in prussia they were frankly protestant militarist partisans of the court and the privileges of nobility their organ was the kreuzzeitung the gazette of the cross with which bismarck had been entirely in sympathy in the first part of his life this party was looked on very favorably by the emperor but less and less so by bismarck for the Chancellor, who belonged to it by his origin and his character as Juncker, was no longer, after the Constitutions of 1866 and 1871, the conservative of strictly Prussian ideas he had shown himself at the beginning of his ministry. In Prussia itself, in the upper chamber, the Conservative Party was about the only one represented, it had strongly supported Bismarck in his fight with the Second Chamber, but little by little it had taken up a position against him. The Chancellor has devoted a whole chapter of his thoughts and memories to the narrative of his rupture with the Conservatives. The opportunity was furnished in 1872 by a law on the inspection of elementary schools, 
the Kreuzzeitung declared war against him. It published a series of articles on the Bismarckian era, which greatly entertained the provincial nobility, but highly displeased the all-powerful master of the Wilhelmstrasse. From the conservatives, properly so called, the liberal conservatives broke away and formed an empire party, Reichspartei. At one time, in 1878, the numbers of its members nearly equaled those of the conservatives, 57 against 59, but eventually it considerably decreased. The Empire Party was principally recruited among the great manufacturers and proprietors, especially of Silesia. It always remained faithful to Bismarck. The National Liberal Party was a sort of right center, and was recruited, more or less, from all parts of the empire, more particularly from the regions on the west of the Elba, which were districts in which industry, commerce, and universities flourished. Its members all belonged to the well-off and intellectual middle class of manufacturers, merchants, and professors. It completely represented the German in opposition to the Prussian spirit and somewhat resembled the spirit of the members of the Parliament of Frankfurt in 1848. Bismarck, the author of German unity, was quite the man for the national liberals, but to retain his majority he had to make concessions to them in the way of free trade and lay ideas. The Progressives had two names, the Party of Progress, Fortschritt, and then, after 1884, Liberal Party, Freisinnig. They were distinguished from the National Liberals inasmuch as they opposed the intense militarism in Germany and remained, to the end, obstinate partisans of free trade according to the English doctrines of the Manchester School. In 1881, they numbered 61 members, principally natives of the great towns of the empire, of the kingdom of Saxony, and in Prussia, of the provinces of Holstein and Prussia. The center, Centrum, was essentially the Catholic party, and was recruited from Bavaria, Baden, and the Catholic provinces of Prussia, namely Rhenish Prussia, Hanover, and Polish Posen. It represented Catholic, conservative, and especially clerical ideas. Many of the electors of the center belonged to the middle and working classes among the populations of the Rhenish and Polish districts, and in consequence the center had links with the democratic parties. Such were the five parties of the Reichstag which possessed any considerable number, their members on an average varying from 50 to 100. But there were other parties made up of different units, Poles, Alsace-Lorrainers, Guelphs, the Democratic Party, Volkspartei, Socialists, etc. The Iron Chancellor affected a supreme contempt for all the members of the Reichstag, anyhow in intimate talk, I'm going to show myself at the Reichstag, he said one day to his confidant, Maurice Bush, and to honor them with my presence. Ah, uh, to whatever party they belong, all these deputies are alike. They're a flock of slaves, all flat on their faces before the master of tomorrow. The only difference is that the conservatives do it in public, while the liberals do it in secret, but apart from that, it looks as if on that day, it was in 1880, Bismarck's memory must have been a little short. He forgot that the center had not given way to him, and that social democracy was, then, a party in inflexible opposition. The strife between the Chancellor and the center lasted nearly fifteen years, and gave rise to immense agitation. Bismarck's partisans gave it the name, an insult to his enemies, of Kulturkampf. The word is said to have been invented by the physiologist Virchow, head of the Progressive Party in the Chamber of Prussian Deputies. Fight, 
for civilization, as if the thesis the center represented were in itself hostile to civilization, as if Catholicism were not one of the higher forms of civilization. At bottom, it was an episode in the eternal question of the relations between church and state. Bismarck belonged to the evangelical or Lutheran church and officially practiced its rites. He used to say that if he had not believed in a divine providence, which had destined this German nation to something good and great, he would have at once given up his post as statesman. I tell you, he said with his colossal pride, that if I had not been so good a Christian, you would not have had so great a Chancellor of the Confederation. But it seems that his faith, so prone to belaud itself, was a pretty near neighbor of indifference, and in that he looked upon religious questions chiefly from the utilitarian and political point of view. When he heard in September of 1870 of the entry of the Italians into Rome, he spoke at once of welcoming the Pope at Cologne or Fulda. He even, it seems, asked the Archbishop of Posen, Ledochowski, to discuss the transference of the Holy See with Pius IX. He spoke of the matter in a singularly free and easy fashion. We should have the Poles with us, he said. The opposition of the Ultramontanes would at once cease in Bavaria. Only there's the king. He would never consent. He fears him like the devil. But there wouldn't be the slightest danger. The Pope would be sitting amongst us like a good old fellow who comes to ask for a little place and eats and drinks quietly and takes his pinch of snuff and even at a pinch smokes his cigar. Such was the Bismarckian fashion of settling the Roman question. From the first, the center was the group of all Catholic deputies in the Reichstag. Among them were some who had long resisted the unification of Germany, like the Bavarians. Others were the sworn enemies of Prussia, like the Poles of Posen. When I set up the Kulturkampf, wrote Bismarck, I was principally determined on it by the Polish side of the question. It is easy to believe this, for one knows the dealings of the Germans with their Polish neighbors, and the legitimate hatred of the martyrs of Posen for their oppressors. A Polish priest, one Schafrenek, elected to the Reichstag, distinguished himself by his patriotic intransigentism. The Prince Bishop of Breslau, on the complaint of the government, forbade him to sit on the left, and as a matter of fact he did not sit again. For, though the sittings might last six or more hours in front of the benches of the left, standing stiff as a sentinel, was always to be seen a big fellow who, without having to rise, spoke and belabored the Germans. It was Schafrenek, the Polish priest. The center, heterogeneous enough on account of the origin of its members, was organized under the strictest discipline by a parliamentarian of the first rank, Windhorst, a former minister of the King of Hanover. He had not forgotten the brutal spoliation suffered by his master in 1866. In an assembly so divided as the Reichstag, the ninety or hundred votes of the center always unanimous, were certainly not a negligible quantity. In July of 1871, Bismarck caused the suppression of the Catholic direction, which for thirty years had had charge in the Ministry of Public Worship of Catholic Affairs in Prussia and was exclusively entrusted to Catholic officials. The pretext for this suppression was the crisis which had just come about in the bosom of the Catholic Church after the proclamation of the dogma of papal infallibility. In reality, its opponents were a minute minority who in Germany grouped themselves around Dolingau, theoretically the head of the old Catholics. But it was not displeasing to Bismarck to be even with his Catholic adversaries in the Reichstag and Landtag, 
by putting on the same footing the small dissident minority and the great majority of those who were faithful to the Vatican. He gave the Ministry of Public Worship to a strong-handed official Falk, who meant to rule the Catholic Church with a rod of iron. The centre had taken up its stand against the opponents of the infallibility and demanded that their chairs in the universities and gymnasiums should not be kept for them. Folk's answer was to get a law passed which ordered the closing over the whole empire of establishments kept by Jesuits and the expulsion of the order. It was then that in the Reichstag, on the 14th of May, 1872, Bismarck gave utterance to the celebrated saying, Have no fear, neither in body nor in spirit shall we go to Canossa. Then, in 1875, came the strife over the laws peculiar to Prussia, known as the May Laws, the establishment of civil marriage, the obligation on future priests to study for three years in the state universities, the nomination of rectors to be submitted to the lay authorities of the province. Concerning the application of these laws, Bismarck, on the 7th of February, 1874, spoke some warlike words. It is a question of cutting off the excrescences of clerical ambition, those excrescences which, if sharp steel is not used in time, will end in spreading to such a pitch that the state would have to submit to the clerical power and would no longer be able to fulfill its duty toward all the religious communities. The protest against the May laws was unanimous among the Catholics in Prussia and was especially strong in all Polish circles. The Archbishop of Posen, Ledochowski, declared that he would never submit. The government put him in prison. Lay commissioners were charged with the administration of the rectories and bishoprics, while ecclesiastics were arrested by hundreds. It seems that later on Bismarck felt some shame about this. I clearly recognized the mistake when I saw Prussian gendarmes, good fellows but clumsy, clanking their spurs and trailing their sabres, running after supple and agile priests, disappearing through blank doors and recesses. Pius IX had openly taken the clergy under his protection. He sent the cardinal's hat to the archbishop Ledochowski while he was in prison. The opposition of the center, too, became more and more violent. Confusion reigned everywhere. Bismarck had thought of making the National Liberal Party the basis of his majority, but Bennigsen, its head, speaking for it, claimed the establishment of the parliamentary regime. On this point, the Chancellor remained refractory. Rather than yield it, he was ready to approach his adversaries. The situation became more and more strained. Bismarck, as if amazed at the gravity of the crisis, was undecided as to what ought to be done. He was playing the game of the declared enemies of Catholicism, perhaps more than he would have wished. I must follow them, since I am their chief. This saying is attributed to him, but in fact it was Dolingaus. The accession of Leo the Thirteenth in February 1878 was to bring about a relaxation of the tension. The new pope, wrote directly to the emperor, who was no party to the violent attitude of his minister, to beg him to give to a large portion of his subjects the peace and quiet of their conscience. At this time, Bismarck needed the votes of the center for his protectionist policy. And little by little, he approached his former adversaries. Windhorst did not repulse these advances, he accepted an invitation to one of those evening parties in the Wilhelmstrasse called Tabakparlament, at which the Chancellor received the members of the Reichstag and let them smoke and drink. The two enemies were reconciled while drinking beer from the Franciscan brewery. It was Falk who bore the cost of this reconciliation. 
he was dismissed in July of 1879. The May laws were speedily suspended and then abolished, except for that concerning civil marriage. The reconciliation with the Vatican was soon manifested by significant actions which the liberals called the journey to Canossa. The future emperor, Frederick III, was received in audience by Leo XIII. The Holy Father sent Bismarck the Order of Christ. He wore its insignia at a great official dinner at Berlin, where he was receiving all the ambassadors. In 1885, when a quarrel was on the point of breaking out between Germany and Spain on the question of the Carolines, the Chancellor proposed to submit the question to the arbitration of the Pope, and he accepted, without a word, the pontifical decision, though it was in favor of Spain. In a word, the Kulturkampf, which had been a great war machine against Catholicism, ended in respect for the rights of the Church. Windhors and the center had prevailed. In the second half of the 19th century, Germany passed through a great economic revolution. The country, which up to that time had been almost exclusively agricultural, became very rapidly a great industrial center. Mining, metallurgical, chemical, textile industries, soared upwards in an extraordinary, one might say a prodigious fashion, and the result was an enormous rush of the rural population to the towns. In 1912, Germany counted 44 towns with more than 100,000 inhabitants, against 39 in England and 15 in France. Consequently, the laboring class had developed in a way as excessive as rapid. In this way, German soil found itself wonderfully well prepared for the diffusion of socialist doctrines. There were two existing schools, that of La Salle, which was properly German and professed state socialism, and that of Karl Marx, which was international and preached collectivism. These merged into one which took the name of social democracy at the time of the Congress of Gotha in 1875. Social democracy had a double program, political and social, which claimed entire freedom, the suppression of standing armies, collective property of mines, of means of production, transport, etc. The party was strongly organized, at each election for the Reichstag, it saw its votes increase, 100,000 in 1871, 350,000 in 1874, 480,000 in 1877. The number of its deputies to the Imperial Assembly grew from 2 to 9 and to 12. In 1890, the year of the fall of Bismarck, it was to be 24. Saxony, the Red Kingdom was one of the party's fortresses. In face of this redoubtable force, day by day becoming more threatening, Bismarck took his stand as the defender of order, property, and all conservative ideas. In 1878, the emperor was nearly the victim of two attempts at assassination, following each other at an interval of less than a month. One by a tin worker, more than half mad, Hödel, the other by an anarchist, a doctor of philosophy, Nobling. The Chancellor took advantage of the indignation aroused by these attempts to make the socialists responsible for them and to get a special law passed against the subversive efforts of social democracy. He had set forth his conception of the social problem. On the one hand, to ameliorate the situation of the workmen, on the other hand, to repress any excess of democracy. He began by the repression. The law of 1878 had been passed for only four years. In fact, this period was twice prolonged, and the law was in force for 12 years. It prohibited any association, 
meeting, or newspaper, which had for its end the subversion of the social order, or in which there was any appearance of socialistic tendencies. The formula was elastic enough to allow of the suppression in one year of 240 associations and of prohibiting 500 publications. During the 12 years that the law was in force, 900 individuals were expelled and 1,500 condemned to imprisonment. On the other hand, the Chancellor, who in 1880 had taken the office of Minister of Commerce and Industry, proposed to reform the economic order of society. Whether this intention of the government be called socialism or not, he said at the Reichstag on the 2nd of April, 1881, matters little the government cannot solve the labor question by imitating the ostrich, which hides its head so as not to see the danger. In the same speech, he spoke of creating practical Christianity. In an imperial message, he made the emperor say, Among the poorer, most numerous, and less educated classes of the population, the idea that the state is not only a necessary, but a benevolent institution must be kept up. The state ought to assist the well-being of all its members, especially the weak. On the 2nd of May, 1884, he himself added, These gentlemen, the Democrats, will set their snare in vain so soon as the laborer sees that the government and the legislature take serious care of his welfare. Sundry laws on insurance against accidents, help for aged and disabled workmen, were the application of this program of state socialism. Financial and economic questions held a great place in Bismarck's relations with the Reichstag. They resulted in making him himself pass from a free trade to a protectionist policy, and consequently to alter entirely the basis of his parliamentary majority. Bismarck, who got so far as to multiply the customs tariffs, acknowledged that his attitude in economic matters was changed, but in these matters only. It is possible, he said in April 1878, that I have changed my policy. But anyhow, it is only in an economic matter I have changed. For in politics, I do not think I have been seen to very much. When I came into power, I had but one aim, the unification of Germany under the hegemony of Prussia. All else was accessory to it. I have subordinated all considerations, economic or otherwise." The founding of the German colonial empire goes back to the last years of his ministry, but it must be said at once that here he was not a promoter, but rather a colonial in his own despite. The Weltpolitik and the universal pan-Germanism, which were the fashion under the megalomaniac Wilhelm II, were things almost unknown to Bismarck and the statesmen of his generation. They were satisfied with Deutsche Politik. As for himself, his political field was somewhat limited, including Germany, Austria-Hungary, Russia in Europe, France, England, and something of Italy upon which he looked down with infinite contempt. The Italians, he said, in 1880, are like those ravens that live on carrion and hang about the fields of battle waiting to get something to eat and he delighted to quote the saying of a Russian diplomat about the Italians, What? They're still claiming something when they haven't lost a battle. Outside these five or six European states, the world did not exist for the occupant of the Wilhelmstrasse. His horizon scarce stretched beyond London, Paris, Vienna, and Petersburg. In February 1874, the Times had published the unfounded rumor of the possible cession of the French settlements in India to Germany. I don't want colonies, Bismarck declared. 
all they are good for is the creation of sinecures. That's all England and Spain do with them. If we Germans had colonies, we should resemble the Polish nobles who have mantles of ermine on their backs and no shirts underneath. It may be supposed that his talk about colonies just then was a little like that of the fox on the grapes. Still, when he saw the great development of German trade, when he saw the merchants of Hamburg and Bremen on the way to make their fortunes on the other side, Drüben, he came to think that to grow coffee or cotton on a German soil had great advantages. The thing tallied with his program of deliberate discarding of a policy of splendor for one concerned only with interessenpolitik. It is not our business, he said in 1882, apropos of affairs in Egypt, to pull the chestnuts out of the fire for the good of others. The private initiative of German commercial houses began to produce results at some points on the African coasts, and Bismarck decided to give these enterprises the protection of the state. And thus, in 1883, arose Southwest Africa, the first German colony, then, in 1884, Togoland and the Cameroons, then later still, East Africa. The International Conference for the Delimitation of the Congo and the Partitions of Africa was held in 1885 at Berlin under the presidency of the Chancellor. He seemed to have become the arbiter of Africa as seven years earlier he had been on the Eastern question. At a committee of the Reichstag, a deputy expressed the fear that the founding of these colonies might bring forth disputes with France for which Germany might not be able to have sufficient naval forces on the spot. In his peremptory fashion, the Chancellor replied, It is not a question of naval forces. Herr Bomberger forgets that France lies before the attacking gates of Metz. Frankreich liegt vor der Ausfallstoren von Metz. What remains today of that African empire on which Bismarck's successors formed such hopes? The present war has wholly given it into the hands of Germany's enemies. The Germans at this hour have neither ermine mantles nor shirts. The work of the organization and consolidation of the empire, on which we have given a hurried sketch, represents remarkable activity on Bismarck's part. In his relations with the Reichstag, he had almost always to remake his majority. He had begun to govern with the left, and then, little by little, he was led to lean upon the right. The semi-official press was trained to follow his evolutions. He supplied it liberally for this end from the secret funds called the reptile funds. This term, become classic, dated back to a speech of the Chancellor's on the 29th of January, 1864, before the Second Prussian Chamber, when he had the property of King George of Hanover and of the elector Frederick William of Hesse-Nassau, two of the vanquished of 1866, sequestered under the pretext of getting the protests of their partisans silenced. We want, he said, to finish with these guilty maneuvers that sport with the tranquillity of a great nation and the peace of Europe. We must pursue these reptiles to their lairs and see what they do there. Let us not, therefore, blame ourselves for the necessity we are in for making such use of this money. Even Bismarck's own partisans sometimes hesitated to follow him because of his violence in all he took up, and as to his adversaries, they gave him no respite. It was as if they took a malicious pleasure in provoking his anger. Therefore, his relations with the Reichstag were almost always difficult and disturbed by many a storm. The emperor had made him a present of some work of art for the Christmas festival of 1884, and Bismarck answered him in these words. I respectfully thank your majesty for your magnificent Christmas present. The work of art your majesty has sent me 
reminds me somewhat of my actual position. While the centaur tries with both arms to hoist the ram upon his shoulders, there comes a woman who hangs her whole weight on his beard. It is just like me. While my hands are full of duties to your majesty and the country, parliamentary opposition drives at me and hangs on to me at the risk of knocking me down while I bear the weight of affairs. The only difference is that the opposition is infinitely uglier than the woman who hangs on to the centaur's beard. But this will not prevent my cheerfully and firmly bearing my load on my shoulders so long as God gives me the strength and I enjoy the favor of your majesty. Bismarck often spoke of his retirement. In 1880 he said, As you see, my health is still uncertain, yet I don't quite know what I have to complain of. I sleep excellently, nine hours a night, he was then sixty-five. I eat with good appetite, but I get tired at once and can't stand upright for long. It is the result of last year's overwork and the things I have gone through. In reality, he was one of those who die at their desk, unless they break their neck in some unforeseen accident. Nobling's attempt on William I in 1878 had the effect of attaching Bismarck still closer to the person of the old emperor. I will never leave him alone, said the chancellor. I took an oath of it to myself when I saw him lying on the ground out there after the attempt. I swore to myself then that I would never forsake him, and whatever may happen, I will keep my oath. In spite of everything, that indefatigable fighter, the Iron Chancellor, declared that he was fatigued, harassed, worn out, müde, tot müde. He was tired to death, and following the example of the great chief, the whole of Germany about 1881 was suffering from empire weariness, Reichsmüdigkeit, to use the picturesque neologism which was invented for this fit of fatigue and boredom. In spite of the intimacy between the two men, the relations between the emperor and the chancellor were not without frequent collisions. The sovereign had too great a sense of his rights, the minister too great a sense of his political superiority, which he did not conceal when with his intimate friends. If I went, he said in 1885, what would be the result? The entire German Empire rests only on the confidence they have in me abroad. Ah, uh, no doubt, I might go temporarily and see how they would get on and then come back as soon as the trial had been made, but it is dangerous to make such experiments. In 1875, he had given up the presidency of the council, passing it on to Roon, and keeping only foreign affairs. He congratulated himself on this determination, which, however, took effect but for a few months. But there was something ironical in his self-congratulation with regard to his relations with William I. Since I ceased to be president of the Council of the Prussian Ministry, I get on much better with the Emperor. I am no longer always at his heels, and when he has some unpractical idea or queer plan in his head, I'm no longer there to bother him. The Empress Augusta had not the gift of pleasing the Chancellor any more than had her daughter-in-law later on. This is easily understood. Born at Weimar, the daughter of the Grand Duke Charles Frederick of Saxe-Weimar and of the Russian Grand Duchess Maria Pavlovna, growing up in the atmosphere of the German Athens where she had known Goethe, Russian, too, on the maternal side. Not only was there nothing Prussian about her, but also she represented German culture at the time when this culture owed its origin to Goethe, Schiller, Wieland, Herder, Kotzebue. It was the age which seems prehistoric today when German civilization had not yet been put into barracks with Prussian corporals mounting guard all around. Moreover, Augusta, Princess Royal, Queen, Empress, in spite of her perfect manners, had never concealed the fact that the Prussianism of the officers and officials amongst whom she was obliged to live inspired her with but scant sympathy. There was besides another grievance. 
she had a great taste for French literature. About the time of the Congress of Berlin, she liked to talk of French writers, French customs, French artists, with a young normal school student who was to have a brilliant career in diplomacy. Bismarck was consistently unjust and mistrustful toward this remarkable woman, accused her of having always wanted to play a part behind the scenes, first with the liberals, then with the ultramontanes and the court preachers. Like Eugenie in 1870, he said, she has, as I have found out since, given direct instructions to officials. The emperor is old and lets himself be more and more influenced by her. She interferes, too, in foreign matters. She has got it into her head that it is her vocation to plead the cause of peace everywhere, to be, as she calls it, the angel of peace. According to Bismarck, all the enemies of the chancellor grouped themselves around her. She was the crystallizing point of this unanimous agreement. End of section 11